great joy <coughs> to see all of you once again. And uh, if you are nearby in this place of A461 Garden Grove Believer, we invite you to come and worship together with us and serve together with us in this place. And today we we'll continue with our uh, series in the book of 1 Samuel and now we are on the book of 1 Samuel 14. Are you glad <laughs> that we go halfway right now? And the topic that I'm going to share with you today is that nothing can hinder the Lord from saving. Amen. How many of you say amen to that? Amen. Or how many of you have experienced the saving power of God in our life sometimes that we think that it's impossible but it is possible. Amen. Let me begin with this story. One day I had a big leadership conference in a socialist country. Okay. And uh, you know that a lot of persecution. And when we do the leadership training like this, you see th this is the process that how we do. That when we pick up the leaders from somewhere and then we take their phone away and then there would be another car we take them to another place before move to the place of the training okay so that's the process because they can easily detect the signal from the phone uh, and they use the devices and suddenly if they can see in one place or one house suddenly you have about 50 of uh, the signals coming up they will say for sure this is playing they have the just gathering or maybe they have some activities because in one home you can only have a few signal right if you have even five phones or even 12 phones just like me okay in my home i have at least more than 20 different devices in order to do for the ministry uh, here but there if any home that suddenly have about 20 or 36 signals immediately they can detect it and they come so usually that we take their phone away and in the past that we usually use the battery. So we have to take away the battery because if you don't take away the battery, the signal is still there. Okay. So those are the things that we learn. But anyway, they are also very good. They can always find out. And one, one time that they found us out and 40 policemen just came and surround in that leadership training. And unfortunately, on that day, I brought about seven or eight Korean they came and they want to see the people and the pastor, the Korean pastor also want to teach them. And that pastor just passed away just a few years ago. And they came with the picture in their hands. And I just finished the preaching and I just go down and I just met with some of the key leaders in a small room. And when they broke in and then they begin to just open one door after another and begin to ask, what is my name? Okay, where, where is Mr. Yang? Okay, they call me by, by Pastor Yang. Okay, so they call me, where is where's Pastor Yang? And they could not find it. And amazingly, in the leadership, in the leadership meeting with only about 15 people at that time, in a small room, in another room, in the same building. And I just finished just sharing with them also. And then I was sitting down and one of my co-workers just stood up in order to share, continue to share and communicate. And then they broke in, they just opened the door and then they begin to look. But I think that God's planning, do you think that I can run away from that day? 40 policemen. Not only on the third floor, the second floor, and the first floor, and outside, there are also many policemen. But when they opened the door, they didn't see me. Because on that day, I was sitting at the chair like this. And just facing my back, just facing the, the, facing the door. 
And when they just open, and they just usually saw my co-workers who stood standing there because they think that I would stand there. But my co-workers stood there and with the tie on, so they don't go inside immediately and they go to other room. And at that time, other leaders said, Pastor, you have to run out of the window immediately. And usually that's what we do. Okay? If you want to have a meeting just like us, nearby the river and when the policeman came, and then immediately you can jump into the river and swim across the river and enjoy the holiday. Hallelujah. Okay. Uh, or there are many ways that I can share with you already before. But anyway, they came in. They could not see me, so they go another place. And during that, only a few minutes. So I jumped out of the window. I went to the balcony on the second floor. And I was about to jump down from there. You know that we are good at that. We are trained for that. You want to learn that? We will teach you how. <laughs> but when I was, I reached the balcony. I was about to jump, to jump down, and then the Holy Spirit just speak to me. Don't jump it down. There are so many of them out there waiting. So when I was about to jump down, the Holy Spirit speaking to me that you should not jump down from there. They are there waiting for me, and I asked Lord, what I'm going to do. Because earlier, I said to the leaders, I'm not going to leave. Because I have many Korean friends here as well. How is it possible for me just to run away and just leave them there? And they just told me, do not worry about that. They will take care of these Korean missionaries and friends. And then I asked the Lord, what I'm going to do? And at that time, I hear very clearly, the Lord said, just go down on the first floor and walk out of the front gate. And I was, you know, sometimes the Lord is very humorous. Will you listen at that moment? It's hard. I said, Lord, they have a picture. They know me. And if I walk now, they will arrest me immediately. But I just obey the Lord at that time. And I pretend to be very calm. But you know that my heartbeat is very fast. <laughs> like this. But I prepare to just walk and as I came to the stair of the second floor, many of them already stood there. And remember, they have the phone, they have the picture on their hands at that time. And suddenly, they just asked him, who are you? And I said, I'm such such such. I'm just that. And then I just walked out. You know what happened? They just let me to walk out, to go down the stair. And when I reached at the front gate, and I was thinking, if I run down out immediately, the spy inside will inform them, and then they will rush out and they will catch me immediately. So I cannot run away from them because they have the police car over there. And then when I walk to the front way, many of them also there. But I just walk through as if they didn't see me. And you know, another miracle happened at that moment is that one of the brothers in the Lord, in the Lord on that day, he came to see me. But when he came, he saw so many policemen, so he didn't come in. And he sit there and he parked his car in front of the building and he prayed for me. And when he saw me go out and he said, come in, come in into the car. So I jumped into the car and he drove up. Just one minute later, just not even one minute, all of the policemen rushed out because the spy informed them that I already walked out. But I'm off. I was safe on that day. And how about the Korean missionaries? And just amazing, at the moments when they announced that I just went out, so all of the policemen just rushed into the front, front, front gate. At that moment, just only a few minutes, the pastor began to prod some of the Korean missionaries. And you know that, and I shared to you, we always have the back door. Because if they come in the front door, we go out of the back door. At that moment, all of the Korean friends was able to escape. And that was a very ama amazement, a very amazing or miraculous deliverance of, of the Lord. And many times we have experienced those things. And I don't know about, about your life. And I'm sure that many times you have experienced like this. And today, let us see about this story how God also used Jonathan in order to deliver the Israelite from the hand of the Philistine 
in a situation where it is impossible. For men, it is impossible. And what does that mean? Let's just go to this one. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 14, verse 1. One day, Jonathan, son of Saul, said to his young armor bearer, Come, let's go over to the Philistine outpost on the other side. But he did not tell his father. And so was staying on the outcasts of Gibeah under a pomegranate, pomegranate tree in Micron. With him were about 600 men, among whom was Ahicha, who was wearing an ephod. He was the son of Ichabod's brother, Ahitu, son of Phinehas, son, the son of Eli, the Lord's priest in Shiloh. No one was aware that Jonathan had left. On this side of the pass, that Jonathan intended to cross to reach the Philistine outpost was a cliff. One was called Moses and the other Senate. One cliff stood to the north toward Mismatch and the other to the south toward Giba. And Jonathan said to his young armor bearer, Come, let's go over to the outpost of those uncircumcised men. Perhaps the Lord will act in our behalf, and nothing can hinder the Lord from saving, whether by many or by few. And that's where I take the title for the sermon this morning. Nothing can hinder the Lord from saving, whether by many or by few. Do that, do all that you have in mind. His armor bearer said, Go ahead, I'm with you, with you in heart and soul. Jonathan said, Come on. Then we will cross over toward them and let them see us. If they say to us, wait there until we come to you. We will stay where we are not and not go up to them. But if they say, come up to us, we will climb up. Because that will be our sign that the Lord has given them into our hands. So one of them showed themselves to the Philistine outpost. Look, said the Philistine. The Hebrews are crawling out of the halls. They were hiding in. The man of the outpost shouted to Jonathan and his armor bearer, Come up to us and we will teach you a lesson. So Jonathan said to his armor bearer, Climb up after me. The Lord has given them into the hand of Israel. Jonathan climbed up using his hand and feet with his armor bearer right behind him. The Philistine fell before Jonathan and his armor bearer followed and killed behind him. In that first attack, Jonathan and his armor bearer killed some 20 men in an area of about half an acre. And that is the beginning of a greater miracle and the victory that the Lord has given to Jonathan and the Israelites. And let us just give a very quick recap today uh, so that we can just see about the situation. With the background, in 1 Samuel chapter 13, we know that Saul, he was hiding. We know that Saul was trying to protect himself with the 600 men surrounding him. And we already learned together that he was in fear and he had no plan to attack the enemies at all. He had no courage to fight, and he had no confidence to win. And the leaders, in the same way of today, that we are losing the battle, and just like so, because we have no vision, we have no more passion, we have no more faith in God, we have not have any confidence that God is going to change the situation. Just like so. Many times, just like so, the leaders have become self-centered. And when I talk about the leaders here, it's not only applied in the government, not only applied in our city, not only applied in, in our works, but also applied in our church, in our ministry. And you see that there will be also many ministries are dying down because there is no second generation who will step up and take the bacon, continue to move forward with the dream and the vision that the Lord has given. And here in 1 Samuel chapter 13, verse 17, we remind us, the enemies seem to be everywhere. The enemies are surrounding. The challenges are tough. And we see that the raiding party went out from the Philistine camp in three detachments. Not only one. They are surrounding the Israelite and they want to attack the Israelite. And uh, 
One turned toward Afra in the vicinity of Shoi, another toward Beth Horon, and the third toward the borderland overlooking the valley of Zebuzim, facing the wilderness. Not only we remember a lot of enemies surrounding, 3,000 chariotti, 6,000, and the people, their army, just as numerous as the sand, and the sand. And the Bible said in verse number 19, not a blacksmith could be found in the homeland of Israel because the Philistines had said, otherwise the Hebrew will make sword or spear. And so all Israel went down to the Philistines to have their plow, points, mattocks, axes, and sickles sharpened. In other words, the rivals had more advantages. In that situation, the Israelite was losing confident because the rival have all advantages. The competitors are very strong and every advantage is in the rival's control. And if they are going to fight in that situation for sure, you will see from verse number 21, the price was two-thirds of the shekel for sharpening blow point and matter, and a third of a shekel for sharpening forks and axes and for reporting goats. In other words, the price is skyrocketing. It's just like today. Everything is so expensive. They don't have the weapon. They don't have the resources. They don't have the material. They don't have the courage. They don't have the passion to fight. What do you think? For sure, they are going to lose. And verse number 22 said, So on the day of the battle, not a soldier, soldier with soul, and Jonathan had a sword, a spear in his hand. How can they fight? You just could imagine the war, Russia and Ukraine. The reason why they still continue to go on for so long, almost two years. In a few months, it's going to be two years. Because they still have the resources. They still have the supplies. They still have the weapons. And they still have the spirit to fight. But for the Israelite, they lose all. They don't have anything. They don't have the spirit. And you know that even though without the women, but if they are strong and high in the spirit, there might be some changes. Do you know that? But here, they don't have even the courage to fight. They are not passionate for the task. And the situation are not in their favor. And that is the situation. Only Saul and his father I'm sorry, Saul and his son Jonathan had the spear, and that's it. And how, can, how could they find among the Philistines when they are as numerous as sin? The first thing that I would like to learn from this story is that even when no one was aware, God is still raising up someone to do the task. Even though when no one was aware of, and maybe you are also in the situation, it seemed that there's no way out. There's no one who, who could help us. There's no one who could deliver us, just like in the situation of the Israelite here. Even though no one will think the deliverance will come. Even though no one will think that the provision will come. But our God is still there. Because as the title said, that the Lord will be able to save you and I, and nothing can hinder the Lord from saving. Even though when the Israelite was under disadvantages, even though when the rivals are so strong, but here we see that the Bible said no one was aware that Jonathan had left. And what does that mean in our world today? People may not know God-given vision, but you and I do. Amen? Amen. There would be someone who still see the vision from the Lord. And even like the case of Israel, that the war is still taking place. Even though they saw that they were being surrounded by the Arab world. But there are also some leaders who can predict, who can trust, and who knows what are the strengths that they have. But most of all, they know that they have a God who protects them and the promises of God will not destroy them after the establishment of their country. And they trust in the Lord. 
And in the same way, people may not agree the potential that God has given to someone, but you do, and you begin to encourage, challenge that person. I remember I have a student who was disabled. And his family also didn't want to accept him anymore. Not only he was disabled, he was on the wheelchair all the time. Not only he's on the wheelchair all the time, he has a cancer and he's going to die for that cancer for sure. The doctor said. So when he was born, in that situation, the parent just threw him out of the house. But his grandfather saw him so beautiful. So his grandfather began to take him in. But he grew up and he's just like the homeless children wandering on the street and living by day. And one day, he accepted the Lord Jesus Christ. And then, when he heard about our Bible school, he said, Pastor, can I go to your Bible school? And at that time, you will scratch your head. He doesn't know how to read and write. He had not even entered into the first grade. <laughs> he never, never entered into the elementary school. Never in his name. He can talk, but he can never read and write. How can you accept that person into the Bible school? And at that moment, when I heard about his situation and other teachers, co-workers asked me about that one. So I come and talk to him. And after that, we prayed for him and we said, come in. Do you know why? Because I saw the passion in the heart of this young man. Even though he looked very disabled. But the way that he talked, he said, now, now I have been transformed by God. I love God. I want to know more about God. And just that point alone, I want to take him, him in. Just the hunger and the desire. But I know another thing that the Lord revealed is that there's something very special about this young man. And to make it short, he studied for almost seven years because he had to make a lot of prerequisites. And he graduated for two degrees, one degree from the Bible school and one degree from Wuhan uh, Normal University. And that is where our system is. We worked together at that time. He graduated from two universities. But you know, during the time that he studied in the Bible school, every week he went out to share the gospel. And just amazing, always on the, on the wheelchair. I was thinking that maybe God also healed him. But God didn't heal him in that way. But he faithfully went out and they pioneered the church. And after the graduation, he was accepted to work in a company. And then his life began to have a great transition in his life. And he began to study another university and he finished his master's degree. Thank God. And he get married and his wife is so beautiful. Even his classmates were jealous of him. How come? I was so handsome, I'm healthy, but I don't have a so beautiful and talented wife. But you see that how that the Lord is going to bring changes. Even though no one was aware of the situation, maybe people may not figure out the deliverance that God is about to bring, but God already spoke to you and keep on pressing on and believing in the promises of God. Maybe people will not realize the breakthrough to happen, but you do. People may not even believe in God's great miracle, but you do, and keep on trusting God for that great miracle. Even Jonathan, there was a time that Jonathan did not want to share to his father alone. There will be a time for share to share about our vision for sure. There will be a proper time to let the people to know what are we doing. There will be a time to pass the vision. There will be a time to challenge the people. But there will be a time that we need to keep quiet and moving on to the vision, to the call, to the burden that God has given to us. And to be honest with you, I still have the plan that I can only share to you in 10 years from now. Could you imagine that? And I bear many times that the Lord reveals something, and I know that it takes time. I just begin to develop, I begin to work on that. Because I learned from the experience is that if the time has not arrived, 
I talk and the people just laugh at me. And in our culture, they said that they laugh until all of their teeth drop. They don't believe. And I remember this is what my sister said. My sister, my younger sister, my real blood sister. She talked to my wife. Sister-in-law, don't listen to my brother. He lives in the air. He doesn't live here a bit but in this earth. He lives in the air because he always had dream. But when I was younger, I'm still young of course. When I was younger, I'm passionate, I share, I talk a lot of things. And I see that the fire is going back on me. But there will be a time just like Jonathan. If Jonathan talked to his father at that time that he's going to attack the Philistine, his father would say, no. You should just keep your sa- your, 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 yourself safe, right? Because Saul was afraid. And even sometimes, when we share about our vision, the people may ha- not have their own dream and vision. They have their own dream and vision. They have their calling and their ministry. They have their own schedule and goals. They have their own mission and interest. They have their struggles and pain. And they might not be able to follow what we do. So we have to be careful when we share at the time that we share. And I was in what I'm just jokingly, I was in seclusion, seclusion for seven years. Next year will be seven years when I was being deported. Will be next, next year will be the seven years. Will be the Sabbath year. And I begin to share the vision more than even I shared before. But let's just remember that even when we think that nothing changed, our God is still always have the ways to open the doors first. Amen. One time, I was so under pressure. You know, at that time, we have a few hundred students in our Bible school. And you know that our students are all free. You are living in a metro- metropolitan city. It is even more expensive than in this place of the U.S., in Western Garden Grove, the place that we live. Even more expensive. The food and everything is very expensive. The dorm and the apartments are very expensive. But you have a few hundred students. And every week that we have to pay the rent for this place, another place for this place. Because unlike the Bible school here, you can have a big place that you can gather all together. We cannot. We are underground Bible school. So every place and every school, we have only from 15 to 20 students only. So we have a lot of places. But one of the things that give us a lot of pressure is about the rent. <laughs> this week, mm, need to pay. Next week, another pay. But many times, I was even unaware of his providences. And I worry. But sometimes God already provide the provision one or two days earlier and I'm still praying for it. Because I didn't have the time to communicate with other co-workers and they didn't have the time to tell us. So I want to challenge all of you today. That even when no one was aware of your situation, our God is still aware and He knows and He saw and He's going to respond to us. Just like Amen. the book of Exodus chapter 3. Amen. When the Israelite was crying out because of the oppression from the Egyptian. But Exodus chapter 3 we say, that the Lord said, I hear from heaven, I see, and I feel the pain and the suffering that the, my people have been going through. And I'm going to send Moses to bring that deliverance. Amen. Let me close today with one point. You know that today I go up with. Usually I have three points. But I saw the time. But I want to challenge all of you today. That even when no one was aware of your pain, let us know that God feel that pain. He Amen. felt that pain. He Amen. know that pain Amen. that you want to. Even though you think that no one cares for us, remember that God will send someone to take care of us. Amen. And even maybe Amen. some of you Amen. are thinking of the needs that we have. 
are so much that no one will be able to open the door for us maybe to make a loan or maybe to have the provision and yet we always see the hands of God is always available in our life Amen, Amen Remember the story that I just shared with you this morning? When I was thinking that God you are talking how can I just walk out of that front gate? I supposedly have to run out of the back door or maybe jump from the balcony. I didn't know that God already provides someone there in order to take me away. Amen. Thank God. How on earth that that brother on that day just came to see me at that moment? It is impossible, right? But we see that when I just walk out, that brother will just call me, get into the car. God already prepared for that one. And even if some of you are still worrying about your needs every day, some of you are worrying about your relationship every day, you are worrying about your children every day, if you are worrying about your financial, about your job, job about your project every day, if you are still wondering about tomorrow, let me share with you, Luke is another great example. Supposedly, we have to think, and I just talked with my wife not very long before. The persecution that I face and my family face, not only saved my life, I shared to you last time, right? If I'm not going out, I will already be dead. Not only saved my life, but God also prepared something greater. One of the things that we always have been praying for, even though we said we don't worry, but we always have worry. It's about the future education of our children, of Luke. We also want to send him to the U.S. to study at that time. And you know how much does it cost as an international student, right? But that persecution came also with a blessing. And today, he got the financial aid, he got the blessing, and my wife and I just use all the money in order to bless the ministry, and we don't have to worry anything. And I talked to my wife, I said, the thing that you say before, why don't we use that in order to invest for the kingdom of God, because God now already provide the scholarship or the grants or whatever it is. Of course, we still have to pay something, but we don't have to pay just like an international student. And you just imagine 70,000, 80,000 US dollars a year, we cannot take it. We cannot support him. We cannot afford to provide. But God opened the door, and today we can see that he can even enter into a good school. And he is going to enter into a greater school by the provision of God. You see that when I'm unaware of all of those, those things, that time I was so upset. I said, I was complaining. I was not happy. And I said, God, why did you do this to me? Yeah, I know about the persecution. But then I have to come here and I have to leave just like from the grass, grassroots, I have to start from zero. So much burden. But yet, our God already knows our situation and He already prepared that seven years before or at least five years before and then Luke came in order to give us the freedom from all of that financial burden in Jesus name so I just would like to encourage all every one of you it's just like the song that our brother Thomas is going to present to us majesty and in his majesty God knows what to do and even though when you think that no one is no one care for you no one is thinking of you no one is protecting you no one is supporting you remember open our mind open our ear and listen and you are going to see how god cares for us and open the door for us in jesus name